Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Kratis. Today is July 26th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. So I know I didn't do a podcast yesterday, so I definitely want to make sure I got one here tonight before the uh, the start of the weekend. A couple of things we're going to talk about tonight. Tonight's episode is titled Trump Against the Democrats. I think, given what I heard today, I don't know if you caught the president this afternoon in the Oval Office, giving some brief remarks and answering some questions to the reporters. This was in, it was primarily centered around immigration and making a deal with Guatemala, which we're going to talk about here shortly. But during the question and answers, obviously, the Mueller investigation came up, what the Democrats are doing and what they're continuing to do to this president and, by extension, this country. And I think the president is beyond fed up. And rightly so, he should be he should be disappointed in uh, with the Democrats at this point. I mean, what a circus it it was! A, a terrible showing from Bob Mueller. I don't even know if he read this report, wrote anything in this report. I mean, most of his answers were were non answers, or he just said, you know, to Congress, uh, it's in the report. I refer you to the report, which is fine, and that is actually in agreement with what Bob Mueller said during his short press conference, or really press statement, I should say, back in May. We say, look, I'm I'm uh, I'm not going before Congress. I'm not answering questions. The re- the report speaks for itself. That's it. That's the end of it. Well, of course, they somehow convinced him or whatever to testify, and it was it was a big nothing burger, which is which is what we've known for the past two and a half years here. Just from what we've had in the public domain was enough to ascertain and to come to this conclusion that there was nothing there. I have to go back and refer to Attorney General Bill Barr in his testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. If you do not like Donald Trump... Don't vote for him. We have an election coming up. Don't vote for him. If you think there's enough information, enough evidence in Volume 1 and or Volume 2 of the Mueller report, then don't vote for Donald Trump in 2020. That's how the process works. Right now, the Democrats are scrambling because I think maybe some of them thought that they were going to get something. There was going to be a bombshell. Maybe they were going to get an aha moment. Gotcha, Mr. President, finally, after two and a half years. Nothing in black and white, but maybe Bob Mueller's going to slip up. He's going to say something perhaps he shouldn't have said, and now it's going to open up another door for further investigations. That didn't happen. It did not happen. It was such a disgrace. It was such a waste of time. But that's par for the course with our government today. It has been for quite some time. So that there is no surprise. The Democrats are now lining up, and they are looking to go after this president on a whole host of other things, money laundering, his personal business, charitable organization, everything. They're they're continuing with this litany of things against Donald Trump. I mean, again, you have to give it to the president for dealing with this type of pressure and these types of investigations. The man, I honestly think, is trying to get things done, which is typically the case of any president, but he has been hamstrung by a Congress that just wants to investigate, investigate, investigate. And all we have from these investigations is nothing, nothing, nothing. Are there some concerns with with, with some of the comments that were made? Uh, sure, I can agree with some of them. I can say, okay, well, this is a little iffy, telling somebody to not say something or to say it this way, or, you know, we, we, we got to get through this and it's being misinterpreted. I can understand that. There's frustration. There's frustration. You're trying to run the, the government, you're trying to get things done, and you're always having to look over your shoulder as to what investigation is going to take place next. So you got to give it to the president. I don't think there's too many people who could take that type of pressure and, and just this type of abuse, quite honestly. And I have to agree with the president when he says you know, that he hopes that this never happens to another sitting president of the United States. And well put, Mr. President, on that note. But the Democrats are not giving up. Uh, Some of them are talking about opening up an impeachment inquiry, trying to get grand jury documents, if there's an investigation on that, looking into some money laundering, things with Deutsche Bank, of course, and and some other institutions. There's no end in sight. I mean, these guys are really making a fool of themselves, the Democrats. I mean, if they were just to listen to the Capitol News, 
they have enough to go after this president on some of the economic things. But th these guys are social socialists. That's what they are at the core. They don't understand economics. They, they couldn't put these thoughts together. They wouldn't know how to keep them going. I mean, you don't have it from Bernie Sanders. You don't have it from Kamala Harris. You don't have it from uh, Elizabeth Warren. Although, again, you have to give credit where credit's due. And every once in a while, you do actually have crazy Bernie and Pocahontas come up with some of the root cause of some of the problems that we face. Their solutions, however, are terrible. They will not solve a thing. They might sound good on paper to some people. There's going to be some sort of debt forgiveness. There's going to be free stuff for everybody from cradle to grave. Uh, but that is not sustainable. It's not realistic. And it just ain't going to happen. It's just not. Especially if you have the Republicans controlling one house of Congress, which is likely to happen. So Bob Mueller was a flop. The Democrats are now scrambling. They're looking for anything, which is what they've been doing for the past two and a half years. But now their little fairy tale has completely turned into a nightmare for them. And given what the president said, sort of just his tone and sort of energy level with it, the man is disgusted. He's fed up with it, and again, rightly so. But he was making some comments against President Obama. He was making comments against Hillary Clinton, the Democratic Party at large. You know, start investigating them that they were looking into the Donald Trump campaign and his administration. They were spying on me. Hillary Clinton, you know, destroys 33,000 emails, physically destroys Blackberries, has a private server in her private residence in New York, and nothing's wrong with it. Not a damn thing. Because you have to remember, folks, what we talked about the other day, that key phrase that those Democrats were using during the Bob Mueller testimony, as if they all had pre-gamed this, it was all pre-planned, that they were all going to say that no one is above the law. Well, this is going to come home to roost for them. It's going to smack them right in the face. I think and I hope. The way, again, that the president was talking, I really do hope that there are investigations because nobody is above the law. And that's true of the president of the United States. I told you, there are things that this president does, the way that he talks about the stock market, for one, in my opinion, is an abuse of power. The way he tweets and the way that he knows the markets are going to react to these comments, that to me is an abuse of power. That to me could potentially warrant some type of investigation. Is he personally benefiting from this? Because he knows, especially during that whole, really during the early stages of the U.S.-China trade talks, and we're going to get to that too because he made some comments in regards to those trade talks because they're, we are going over to China next week to once again resume these talks. So early on, the president knew if he came out or he sent Larry Kudlow or another member of his economic team out to the mainstream media or they released a press statement or he took to Twitter, that the markets were going to rally, and they did, and they did so for months, and we talked about it here on almost a daily basis. So it's not like this was a one-off. This was a near-daily occurrence. The markets were selling off. Send Larry Kudlow out there. Tell him everything's fine. Let me tweet that the talks are going great and fantastic. And the market turned around and it rallied. How do we know he's not personally enriching himself or somebody, a friend of a friend? I hope that's not happening. But this, this Bob Mueller stuff, this Russia stuff, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. There was nothing there there. And that name again, Joseph Massoud, the guy that kickstarted this whole thing, that entrapped George Papadopoulos. Papadopoulos lies to the FBI. They prosecute him. He, sent, he spends time in prison. Okay, he does his time, whatever. Joseph Massoud, he, he supposedly lies to FBI. He's walking around free. So something fishy is going on here, and it has been for quite a while. The president also mentioned again the Clintons in their charitable organization. So I hope all of this comes to a head. I hope we, we start to get the inspector's general reports coming out here in the near term, investigating the investigators. Hopefully the U.S. attorney out of Connecticut, who is supposedly looking into the genesis of this investigation into the president, hopefully that starts to pick up some steam and anything else that Attorney General Bill Barr might be doing hopefully starts to see the light of day here sooner than later, because we need to know the truth. Our republic is on the line. This is not an exaggeration. I mean, that is true, whether that's being said from the Republicans or whether that's being said from the Democrats in regards to Donald Trump. That's true. It is in the balance. We cannot have a two-tiered justice system. 
not for a second. Could you imagine if they had found that Donald Trump and company destroyed 33,000 emails? Could you imagine how the mainstream media would be handling that? I mean, you would never hear the end of it. If he destroyed three emails, you would never hear the end of it. But Hillary Clinton, 33,000, physically destroys Blackberries, not a problem. Apparently, she is above the law. Not a problem. Why don't you try doing that? I don't advise it, but what happens if you, th if you, if you did that? What do you think would happen to you? He'd lock you up and throw away the key, no doubt about it. So the Democrats are scrambling, and I hope that the president and his administration really start to turn up the heat on these Democrats and do a 180 because this is enough. This, uh, the, the country, and, and there, there has to be some there there. I mean, this investigation happened, the Russia investigation. This took place. There is a beginning to this. There is a genesis to this that needs to be uncovered, and it needs to be made known to the American people for the sake of our republic, for the sake of justice. It has to come out. It has to. And this better not just be talk. This better not just be some spin placating to the base. There has to be some actual action. There needs to be justice. There has to be because we cannot continue operating in this manner. We're just, we are destroying ourselves. This is divisive. Nothing is getting done. The Democrats are not working with this president on immigration despite the fact that a lot of the policies that the president wants to put forth are things that the Democrats have already agreed to. It's simply the fact that Donald Trump is the president. He is sitting in the Oval Office, and they can't support it. The USMCA, the NAFTA 2.0 between the United States, Mexico, and, and Canada, will the Democrats come on board and pass that? Serious question. Well, we know they're not going to pass it at least for another six weeks because they're on holiday. They're on recess. They're on vacation. So that's at least another six weeks out. We now know that there's not going to be, well, we, at least for now, there's not going to be any type of infrastructure bill either. I mean, if anything, you would think, well, you know, that's, that's bipartisan. We can get together on that. Donald Trump's a developer. He's a builder. That's what he likes. Democrats love those types of projects. It's domestic spending. Nope, Nancy Pelosi had to make a comment. Donald Trump had to make a comment. It's schoolyard antics. And so that's on the back burner. If it's even on the back burner, it might be completely off the stove. So who knows what's going to happen there? Other regulatory issues, environmental issues, energy issues, tax issues. What's going on with the Federal Reserve? Can we get a grasp, a handle on our national spending, our deficits, our national debt? Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? Big fat no. Because the one thing that Democrats and Republicans and the president could all get around was increasing the debt ceiling, which means we are going to increase our deficits, increase our national debt with no end in sight. Somehow the president wants to claim this is a victory. He was telling the, the Republicans to get on board with it and pass it. I mean, this is ridiculous. Where are my fiscal conservatives? Th this isn't what we voted for. If you want to drain the swamp, you don't give the swamp more money. You don't say, okay, here's a credit card. There's no limit. Here's a blank check. Do what you want with it. That's not draining the swamp. It's not even close. Not even close. But that's the only thing that our government can agree on. Republicans, Democrats, and the White House. Oh, yeah, we can continue to raise our national debt. That's not a problem. This, this is ridiculous. That in and of itself could lead to higher interest rates because it becomes more difficult to make those payments. Unless, of course, you have a central bank who's ready to print more money, which, of course, they are. And we're going to get to that in a little bit, too. But again, the main reason for Donald Trump's little presser in the Oval Office this afternoon was in regards to a deal that was struck between the United States and the government of Guatemala, where Guatemala is now going to be basically a go-between. They are going to be sort of, I guess you could say, a registered country, whereby anybody in Latin America or South America or anybody who's making their way north to the United States, once they get to Guatemala, that's where they're going to stop and stay if they're going to file for asylum. And then that's where they're going to stay until that case is heard here in the United States. It is also my understanding, at least at this point, I'm no attorney, This and, and that doesn't even matter that I'm not an attorney because judge, some judge somewhere is probably going to overrule the 
Trump administration anyway, because that, that's just simply par for the course here on a lot of things they want to do. But at least what the president and the uh, acting secretary of defense uh, of Homeland Security, I should say, were uh, stating this afternoon was should an individual get through Guatemala and make it to the United States and claim asylum, they will not be granted that status. They will be sent back. They will be sent back. So this is obviously trying to slow down the volume, mitigate the volume of people getting into the United States, having them sort of, I guess, housed, if you will, in Guatemala until their case is heard and then a decision is rendered. And then they're either coming into the United States or they're going back to where they came from. So at least we're getting somewhere there. Again, the president was praising uh, obviously Guatemala here, but was again praising the Mexican government for sending their troops down to the border to stem the flow of immigrants who are going to be making their way to the United States. Again, look, you look at the demographics of this country, we need immigrants. We are very pro-immigrant here on the Capitol News, but you have to do it legally. That, that, that's so simple. What is so difficult for Democrats and liberals to understand? I mean, something must be missing in their brain, quite physically. And this is no joke. I am 100% serious. Something must be missing. Because what don't you understand? You are either a nation of laws or you're not. Republicans and a whole host of other Americans are not xenophobic. They're not racist. Are there a handful somewhere scattered around? Probably. But that's on both sides. That's everywhere. Okay, that's an unfortunate reality. Come in here legally. You want to come to this country, your first act to become to becoming a U.S. citizen should be a legal act, not an illegal one. Period. End of story. Why Democrats and liberals can't wrap this around their head, I don't know. Something must physically be missing from their brain. That's the only logical conclusion one can uh, come up with. Because it's the easiest thing to say. Instead, nope. You're a racist. You don't want them here. We, you just come in legally. That's it. Are you a nation of laws or no? Because these are the legislatures, by the way. Their job is to make laws. If you don't like the law, well, then why don't you change it? But that's not even what they want to do. They just want to, they just want to throw a hissy fit and point the finger and say that everybody's a racist. Of course, they're not racist. They make everything about race, but everybody else is the racist. So solve that one, too. Something else must be missing upstairs. The president was also asked during this, this I don't know, it wasn't that long, 10, 15 minutes maybe, if that. He was, of course, asked about the strength of the U.S. dollar. The economy came up because the first snapshot of our GDP figure for the second quarter of 2019 came out, and it slightly beat expectations. Estimates were for 1.8% growth. The reading on the initial estimate was 2.1%. Of course, typically any time uh, the first reading is usually revised one way or the other. Rarely does it stay two point, you know, the, what the initial reading is, so in this case 2.1%. But we'll find out as the weeks and months progress here. But that's where we're at. We're at 2.1%. It beat expectations of 1.8%. And the president was asked a question about the strength of the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar has been appreciating over the past couple of weeks because we have a whole host of central banks the world over who are cutting their interest rates, getting ready to embark on their versions of quantitative easing and saying that they are likely to keep interest rates lower for longer. So fantastic. But I have to tell you, all of my podcasts, I mean, I'm not big on social media, but everything, all these podcasts and everything I do on the capitalnews.com, it does go out into the social media atmosphere, if you will. And I have been tweeting at the president all of these podcasts. Perhaps he's listening. Because typically, this was a softball of a question that typically the president would have said, oh, yeah, the U.S. dollar has to be weakened. It just has to go lower. Has to. Now he's making statements. Well, well, you know, the country's strong, and now the U.S. dollar's strong. Well, maybe he's listening here. Because we do not need nor want a weaker U.S. dollar. We need a stronger U.S. dollar. You destroy the value of the currency, you make everything more expensive, especially for middle-class Americans, which is Donald Trump's base, by the way. 
We have enough problems as it is. We, we're, we're, we have an economy that's slowing down despite what the president says. The global economy is slowing down. The president agrees with that, that the global economy is slowing down, but somehow the United States is sort of an island unto ourselves, which is not true. We are too interconnected with everything. Just not going to happen. Not going to happen. And that's something that the president has to be made aware of if he's not. The interconnectedness of this global economy is extremely complex. There is not a man or woman on this earth that fully comprehends it. You can't, because you're talking hundreds of trillions of dollars when you bring in the financial markets and derivatives and a whole host of other things. Nobody can understand this. And, other, and you don't know a lot of the counterparties because a lot of this happens on unregulated markets. Okay, so nobody can possibly understand the delicacy and the intricacy of this interconnectedness. Now, the president was, of course, out to say the U.S. is doing fantastic, China is slowing down, Europe is slowing down, and therefore the Chinese yuan is depreciating. And, of course, again, he's saying that the Chinese were depreciating their currency and the euro is going down, and that's because Europe is very weak. All true. All true. But guess what happens when Europe slows down? And guess what happens if and when China really slows down or there's some sort of another credit or financial crisis in either one, e either in Europe or in China or both or some combination thereof. It's going to have consequences the world over. Just like when we had our cre credit crisis, our financial crisis a decade ago, that was felt the world over. We will feel it here if it happens in China, if it happens in South Korea, if it happens in Europe. We have our own issues to deal with here too as well. So that's something that the president has to understand. I mean, he can, he can flex his muscles and say, you know, I'm tariff man, and all these tariffs are fantastic, and he continues to say that we're bringing in billions and billions of dollars because the Chinese are basically writing a check to the U.S. Treasury, which again, ladies and gentlemen, is not true. Importers in this country pay that tax and or they pass it off to us, the consumer, or some combination thereof. Okay, so they're either getting their margins squeezed if they're going to eat some of it, or they're going to pass that cost, that cost increase to us, the consumer. And that's exactly what's happening because we're in the midst of earnings season. And if you read some of these reports and pay attention to some of them, they're like, yeah, well, you know what? The consumer seems to be doing fine because they're, they're paying these higher prices. So even if these companies aren't doing as much volume, but if they have an increase in their price and people are paying the price, well, it looks like they're, they're beating revenue. They're, re they're beating expectations. This isn't because of necessarily organic growth. It's because prices are going up. But, of course, we're told there's no inflation either, which is simply not true. Now, again, the president was quick to criticize the Federal Reserve once again, taking to Twitter, making comments that had the Federal Reserve not increased interest rates as much as they have and also embarked on quantitative tightening, which is just pulling liquidity out of the system. We had quantitative easing for nearly a decade. Now they started tightening for the past year and a half, two years. He's complaining about that. He said, well, we could have had 4%. We're only at 2.1%, still strong, still beat expectations, but it could have been much, much stronger. Continuing to blame the Federal Reserve. We are perfectly fine with the president attacking the Federal Reserve. The problem is the president is calling for lower interest rates and for more quantitative easing. That's more of the disease. If you're going to say, because it's true, that low interest rates for a long period of time led to the financial crisis, then how can you say even lower interest rates for an even longer period of time is going to be the solution? It's completely illogical. It makes no sense. It is not the solution. You have to allow the malinvestments, you have to allow the zombie companies that exist all over the world, you have to allow them to liquidate. You have to allow them to go through bankruptcy. You have to allow them to go out of business if that's what it takes. You have to. This is malinvestment. It is taking good resources and you continue to throw it after bad. That's not how it's supposed to work. Not at all. Now, again, perhaps the president's listening here because another thing that he brought up was the U.S.-China trade negotiations. And now, again, he's in no hurry. He's in no hurry. But now he's sort of saying, well, look, China might just be sitting back. We're going back. Yeah, we might have a deal. We might not have a deal. I really don't care. This is the president saying this. I really don't care. Because when I do win in 2020, there's going to be a deal basically the next day. Which, if that happens and he actually does win, which I'm still, I'm still predicting that he will, given this current course of events, but next November is a lifetime away in politics right now. 
if the Chinese are, be are, are basically saying, well, you know what, we've, we've already been doing this dance for a year. What's another year? What's another year? No big deal. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. You want to come over here to China? We'll put you up. We'll treat you right. And then when we come over here, you know, you treat us right, and we'll, we'll just keep going back and forth. That's fine. And maybe Bernie Sanders will win, or maybe Pocahontas will win, or maybe Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. And then we'll just take them, you know, we'll just eat their lunch. We're not worried about it. We'll just, we'll just keep kicking the can down the road. We'll just, you know, we'll play nice, and that's going to be it. That's like we said. Rope-a-dope. That's all it's going to be. Now you got the president out there saying, look, they're just going to wait. So we're in no hurry. We'll continue to bring in billions and billions of dollars. We're taking in those billions and billions, and we're paying our farmers, and the farmers are better off than what they otherwise would have been. I mean, uh, first off, a lot of that's not true there. It's American businesses and consumers who are paying those tariffs. That's a tax. That's what it is. And we are subsidizing our farmers. The president wants to criticize other countries for subsidizing their industries. Well, we subsidize ours here, too. This is not in retaliation. It's not like this is something new. This is something that's been going on for a very, very long time. Or it's, our, it's our welfare state. You have a welfare state that takes care of the lower echelons of the income brackets. And then you have a welfare state on the corporate end that takes care of some of the largest corporations in the world. And who gets squeezed but the middle class? And again, we don't like making it about class warfare here, but this is what happens. That's where you're squeezing it from. That's where the money is. That's where the vast majority of the population is. So that's who you're squeezing. And ironically, that's why Donald Trump is president of the United States, because the middle class has been squeezed for too long, and people said, enough of this. We're giving the one-finger salute to the system, and we're voting in Donald Trump, and that's exactly what we did. He's there. He might not know what he's doing. He might not know a damn thing about government and legislative process and this, that, or the other. But guess what? We don't care. We are not voting for Hillary Clinton. We don't need more of the same. The system is corrupt. Something is wrong. We just feel it. We know it. We're going to give this guy a chance. That's where we are. So for the president to come out and make statements, before at least, that he wanted a weaker dollar, that, that's, again, going to hurt the middle class disproportionately, and tariffs. That's also going to hit the middle class disproportionately. So, you know, the president, I understand what he's doing. There are structural changes that need to be done. But this goes back to what we've been talking about for a very long time here, where the president erroneously and foolishly took ownership of the stock market and the economy. Now he has to watch. But, of course, he doesn't want to take any credit for the economy only hitting 2.1% instead of three or four. He doesn't want to say anything about the trade tariffs or anything like that. It's all the Fed's fault, which is what we've been telling you for months here is what this, this president was going to do. He'll take responsibility for all of the great things, but anything that's eh, wishy-washy or no good, it's somebody else's fault. My opinion, that's poor leadership. But that's what this president is doing. That's what he, that's, that's what he does. Like it, like it or not, that's what he does. S&P. New records again today. It was up 22 points, up 8 tenths of 1%. The Dow gained 51. The NASDAQ gained 92 points, up 1.1%, also making new record highs. The Russell 2000, the small cap index, gained 17.5 points, also an increase of 1.1%. The Dow Jones Transports gained 8 tenths of 1%. The New York Stock Exchange was up one half of a percent today. Oil, WTI is now trading around $56 and change. Brent, the international benchmark is at $63 in change per barrel. Gold is at $1,419 an ounce. Silver is trading at $16.41 an ounce. Uncle Sam's 10-year treasury is now yielding 2.08%. Sort of in a wait-and-see mode because obviously the Federal Reserve is meeting next week, so there's probably going to be quite a lot of volatility after the announcement on Wednesday. And VIX, the volatility index, lost about 5 percentage points today, is now trading at $12.16. So again, the S&P and the NASDAQ, again, are at new time record highs. Yesterday, I did not do a podcast, but the NASDAQ and the Russell both, they both were down 1%. Yesterday, they were down 1%. Today, they were up 1%. So this is very timely, if you recall a recent podcast when we were talking about volatility. I updated our volatility model, which again is very simplistic, but it is highly predictive. 
And we were telling you that we are going to be seeing, the remainder of this year, we are going to be seeing these 1% moves. Very timely because the past few days we have been seeing 1% percentage moves. Now, typically speaking, when you look at the model and you have that type of volatility, it's typically to the downside. It's usually a negative 1% or negative 1.5, negative 2, whatever, okay? That does not have to be the case. That does not have to be the case. Despite my bias and analysis to the downside, it is quite possible that there could be some sort of melt-up in the stock market and in other financial assets because you have central banks the world over who are signaling that they are ready to cut interest rates if they haven't already begun to do so and that they are going to be staying lower for longer once again and they are going to embark on other rounds of quantitative easing or some other type of manipulation if they have to. And that's just, you know, reading between the lines that they are going to. Not that if they have to, but they're going to. Okay? My whole argument has been and remains to be the case that the law of diminishing marginal returns is kicking in and it will kick in. The hardest part of that is timing it. That's the hardest part of all this because this is this is a global economic experiment. And again, this isn't like the weatherman. If he says it's going to be sunny out and it rains, all right, your picnic's ruined. You go home, you played another picnic. When economists are wrong and they're pulling the levers of the economy in determining the price of capital, if they're wrong, you lose your home. And are they held accountable? No, they're not. They're not. They're not held accountable. Nobody will go to jail. Nobody will have any, I mean, it's not like you have a, you, you need a license to be an economist. So it's not anything like, nothing's going to be revoked. I mean, there, there's no punishment. There's nothing. There's nothing. Well, we went well. We, we built some models and we thought they were going to hold up. Sorry, you lost your job. You lost your house. You lost your car. You lost your business. Sorry, we made a mistake. Too bad. Should have been more careful there, bud. We're fine. You know, we're making six figures, seven figures, we're selling books, we're doing we're giving speeches, we're you know, we're 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 whining and dining with the powers to be on Wall Street and in Washington DC and other capitals around the world. Uh, but you uh, yeah, sorry, should have been more careful there. This is ridiculous. This is why we talk about you want solutions? You end the Federal Reserve and you abolish the federal income tax. You start with those things. If those two things don't happen, there's not going to be a solution for anything unless and until there is just a c catastrophe with another Great Depression-like situation, which could quite frankly happen because of the amount of debt that exists. At the consumer level, the household level, the corporate level, and government level, we are awash in debt. And that's why these central banks are going back to cut interest rates because they are trying to prop it up. They are trying to keep everybody afloat. What does that tell you? It tells you that fundamentally speaking, the economy around the world, businesses around the world, households around the world are weak or are getting weaker. You don't need to do these types of measures if everybody's strong. You don't need to prop somebody up if they have strong legs, if they have a strong base. And that's the word that is used, propping them up. I mean, it's in your face. So it's going to be interesting to see because we are in an experiment. The fact of the matter is, however, it's tragic because people will lose their jobs. We're already seeing it. People will lose their homes. And nobody will be held accountable. And I don't know which part of that is worse, but um, that's, that's unfortunately where we are. But we have to pay attention, stay vigilant. Stay diversified. Stay with the Capital News. Everybody, have a safe and enjoyable weekend, and we'll catch you here next week. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.